Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cave of the Cross Projects. I'm Patrick. And I'm Tony. And we're in the midst of Chapter 16 of our book, Faith Has Its Reasons, by Kenneth Boa and Robert M. Bowman, Jr. And uh, we're trying to make the case that fetism, just just believe, man, uh, is actually more than <laughs> just that just statement. Just believe, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so what we've done uh, so far is kind of defined our terms a little bit. Uh, well, and our authors have tried to make the case that fetism is actually uh, should be considered in the apologetic method um, uh, that we've covered uh, with the uh, previous three classicalists, uh, evidentialists and reformed uh, apologetics. And uh, and we've covered kind of uh, within the history of Christianity, we've covered uh, really three um, uh, uh, people within uh, the scope of uh, what uh, we lovingly refer to as uh, kind of proto fetus. And now we kind of turn to those who would probably embrace the term uh, a little bit more heavily here. And uh, ones that have kind of caught up to uh, the 19th and 20th century uh, and ones that you probably uh, have heard about or read about or the names uh, uh, seem to, to to be familiar at least in, in some fashion so uh, we'll cover um, uh, the final three uh, here uh, in chapter 16 of our book well first we start with uh, Soren Kierkegaard and he lived from 1813 to 1855 uh, so you know uh, right before uh, the Civil War happens he decides to uh, launch a movement of uh, a new apologetic method that uh, that he's been studying. But he lived a relatively short life during which he was not widely known outside his native Denmark. Uh, yet in the 20th century, he became one of the dominant influences in Western philosophy and theology, uh, which is uh, probably like uh, all your starving artists to uh, die, have all these paintings, and <laughs> then you can become a millionaire off, off them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so <laughs> I'm, I'm sure he feels really good but uh, right about now. Well. <laughs> Uh, Kierkegaard is generally regarded as the father of both religious and atheistic existentialism, which is impressive, right? He yeah. did both of them. You, <laughs> what have we done? We've done nothing. He's done both sides of the issue, which is impressive. <laughs> While evangelicals generally view Kierkegaard negatively in light of his role in the rise of modern existentialism and neo-orthodoxy religion and theology. While not denying the problematic aspect of his thoughts, our focus will be, uh, our authors, uh, will be on explaining what m many Christian thinkers have found of positive value in Kierkegaard in order to understand the appeal to fetism. And he has written more than just this, and um, uh, he, he does uh, a, a very good job of, of writing. Uh, he's uh, uh, one that you have to take your time, but uh, I've, I've read a few of his um, articles, and uh, th they are impressive for uh, someone of that time period, too. And so our authors tell us Kierkegaard wrote most of the books for which he is now well known under pseudonyms. <laughs> and so, right? Fake names. And so in his uh, one book, uh, Concluding Unscientific Postscript, Kierkegaard explains that in his day, virtually everyone was considered a Christian. Right. So how do you talk to anybody if everybody thinks they're already a Christian? Right? <laughs> right. And yet he says that Christendom fell woefully short of the true Christianity of the New Testament. And so in such a situation, Kierkegaard realized he could never get people to see the problem of attacking their status as Christians directly. He says, if it is an illusion that all are Christians and if there is anything to be done about it, it must be done indirectly not by one who uh, vociferously proclaims himself an extraordinary Christian, but by one who, better instructed, is ready to declare that he is not a Christian at all. A direct attack only strengthens a person in his illusion and at the same time embitters him, right? So again, this is going to kind of be an indirect attack. that We kind of saw this with Pascal's wager, right? Kind of an indirect kind of apologetic is what he's after here. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, th this type of model also of flows uh, a little bit uh, um, parallel to uh, the reformed apologetic with trying to get people to take a step back from embracing the science and saying, well, let's look to see if your worldview actually allows you to embrace science or logic or other minds or et cetera, et cetera. And so here he's he's going to try and take a step back from what he wants to push forward and say, uh, is there a, a different line uh, that uh, the, of argumentation that we can go go down that doesn't 
cut somebody off because you're attacking um, uh, something that uh, that they hold on to as a part of their identity. And uh, in the 21st century, uh, we have less of this problem, which I actually view as a positive thing. But think about uh, from uh, his time period up until um, pretty much the 1960s is you had people say, well, of course, I'm a Christian. I'm an American. And th <laughs> that's that's kind of a, a, a well um um, well known mindset uh, you know if 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 you're not one of uh, 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 you know the Jewish faith or the Muslim faith uh, then um, clearly you have to be something and if you're an American it's it's just more Christian and put other and you'll you'll be good <laughs> well we see here a kind of apologetic at work but an unusual one in that its purpose is not to convert people of other religions to Christianity but to convert people of the Christian religion to authentic Christian faith. That's his goal, is he wants to move people from Christian religion, the things that you do, the the the, the potlucks, and he actually wants you to listen <laughs> to the Bible being preached before the potluck comes in. That's right. Then yeah. you can eat. Right, right. Then, then you get your treat. <laughs> Kierkegaard is commonly, as we believe rightly, described as a fetus. However, the context in which he advocated a fetus approach to the truth of Christianity is all important. He was sharply opposed to the traditional defenses of Christian orthodoxy because he believed they led only to a conceited sense of intellectual triumph among philosophers and theologians and distorted the essence of the Christian faith. So he didn't want you just to, well, I, I believe God because, you know, uh, something blew up in the beginning. Therefore, I know God exists. Therefore, you know, everyone else is wrong. And there, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. Good. That's right. That's right. <laughs> And I'm, you know, and I'm intellectual and I'm smart and I've, you know, you know, it's kind of like a, uh, you know, uh, my uh, belief is based on my intellectual ability, kind of intellectual right. works, right? Mm -hmm. And so our authors tell us that although Kierkegaard opposed traditional apologetics, he offered a kind of indirect, as we mentioned, uh, apologetics for Christianity in keeping with his method of indirect communication. Uh, C. Stephen Evans, again, they suggest, has identified four basic apologetic arguments in Kierkegaard's philosophical fragments. So this was, again, one of his uh, one of his uh, uh, books. So the first one here with regard to this apologetic argument, they call the no human author argument. So what is the no human author argument all about? Well, in sending forth the Christian position as a thought experiment, uh, Johannes uh, Climactus, this is Kierkegaard's pseudon, um, you know, pseudonym for the author there, uh, presents it, that is Christianity, as hypothetical or imagined to which his interlocutor uh, objects that the position is already well known. So what do you mean, you know, <laughs> that it's a hypothetical, right? We already know the position. Well, Climaticus uh, admits this, but suggests Everyone who knows it also knows that he has not invented it. So, yeah, it's well known, but you know that nobody, at least you know, you didn't invent it, right? Mm -hmm. And so from this oddity, then, Climaticus uh, concludes that the lack of any human author demonstrates the truth, right? And so there's some uncertainty as to what uh, this claim uh, that, uh, you know, no one have, would invent it is. And so they suggest that uh, Evans gives us kind of an, an interpretation of this. Evans suggests that in the context, Climaticus' uh, point is that the idea that human beings are spiritually dead and incapable of overcoming this position is not one that could naturally occur to any human being, but can only be known after God has revealed it, mm -hmm. right? So that's kind of uh, Evans' kind of take on the argument here that um, Kierkegaard is is giving us. Yeah, who you know who would come up with this idea? Well, we're all dead; we can't know it, and so only God has to reveal it. He he suggests nobody would come up with something like that, and so that demonstrates that it's true, yeah. kind of thing. Right? Well, and and the uniqueness of the Christian message, uh, the I mean, the Old Testament, you have. The, the separation so much, you know, the the all, all the things that we hear about the shellfish and the the tattoos of the cutting in the flesh, the the uh, not uh, having two fi mixed fibers together it was to separate uh, the Jewish people out or the Hebrew or the Israelite people, depending on which which area of history you're looking at. Um, uh, it, it separates them out from 
the 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 false gods around them, the the false people around them, the, those who worship, those who did the sacrifice and expected why uh, crops, uh, 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 victory in war, um, safety, uh, what have you, uh, and then you had the uh, Israelite people join them, but then uh, the 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 message from the prophets were no, that's not what we want. Turn against that. Uh, we we are looking forward to the coming Messiah, the 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 perfected uh, um, uh, 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 finalization of of all these sacrifices that point towards that. You have uh, the apostles who, uh, again, uh, we, we we talked about uh, last episode, uh, where I have this argument from embarrassment, where uh, the, you know the the, the Jesus t teaches uh, for those who have ears to hear. And what happens to, to the apostles? Well, they go to Jesus and go, okay, wh but what did you mean by that? <laughs> so, so you don't have, you don't have, you know, the conspiring of, of, of Paul and Peter and James saying, okay, uh, l let's write this down and say, okay, uh, y instead of having exactly what every other religion has, which is this uh, input A, output B attempt, uh, let's do the complete opposite and bring God down in human form, but he's still fully man and fully God. And then let's uh, uh, teach a Trinitarian deity where uh, there's one being with three persons. And so, you know, I could uh, multiply examples upon myself here of talking about the uniqueness of the Christian religion. And what Kierkegaard here is saying is that it's so unique, it's so different. It doesn't, it, it couldn't have originated. That story couldn't have originated, man. In fact, look at uh, the, the, the Muslim religion afterwards. Go conquer by the sword. Well, of course, that, that's, that's standard uh, religious operating system uh, that's, uh, that's uh, been known from every other religion. And so there's, the, you know, do these things and you get output B. Well, that's a return back to exactly what we see within uh, every other framework. But the Christian framework is you can't do anything. And so you have to trust, you have to have faith in the one uh, uh, fully God and fully man and his work on the cross. I mean, you know, the, try making that story up. It's it, <laughs> it's difficult. You know, yeah. if, if, if on one hand, you know, our atheist friend wants to talk about all these Bronze Age goat herders who can't do anything. But then on the other hand, that that th those Bronze Age goat herders upended the entire might of Rome, uh, were able to spread its religion throughout the known world using those same Roman roads. And then when Rome was about to, uh, to yeah, fall without, by the way, right. without attacking, without great exactly. armies. And, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Yep. Exactly. So uh, I'm long winded here, but I, I want to make this point clear because we might get lost in what Kierkegaard is making as as a a legitimate and decent point here is that uh, the Christian religion uh, is something that would be very difficult to, to make up and really hasn't been done because all other major religions in the world is this input A, output B type type thing. In fact, uh, the, 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 the cults of Christianity, the, the Mormonism and Je uh, Jehovah's Witnesses is a return form to input A, output B as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> the, 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 there's my mini sermon right there. Yeah, so well, that's the that's no just the first one. Author, we yeah, have four. Arthur. We have yeah. four. <laughs> See again, Kierkegaard. Yeah. <laughs> well, the second one is the argument for the uniqueness of the incarnation. The second apologetic argument is very much like the first. Uh, Kierkegaard here in his poem about God becoming a man in order to be our teacher and savior is again shown not to be his invention or the creation of any other human being. It must have come from God Himself. And again, this isn't just uh, you know what, what what we see and and um, what other uh, YouTube videos have tried to say is oh you know the 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 incarnation of Jesus is exactly like Osiris and all, all these other ones except you have to change exactly what what the 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 story that is uh, claimed to be and uh, you're having to input christian words into uh to uh, uh the, the original story to make it more seem like oh look there's a baptism here there's there's an incarnation here well i mean yes okay if you uh take a, a, a bite from the shoulder of the mother and then form it out of clay to, to make a being of of this you know mini god well, okay, then we can call that an incarnation. But is that is is, is that exactly what <laughs> the the Christians uh, from from the line of a a a, a, a Jewish um, uh, uh, Old Testament 
um, carryover <laughs> is 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 referencing, or is this something unique and and um, singular within the the scope of of this uh, new movement that comes about in a person? Yeah, yeah. All right. So we've seen the no human uh, author argument. We've looked at the argument from the uniqueness of the incarnation. The third kind of argument our book suggests is the argument from offense. So those who hear the story of the incarnation and disbelieve it are always offended at it. Right? <laughs> I dare you. Right? Uh, a fact that Climaticus uh, takes as confirmation of its truth. Right? The the very uh, way that they're offended confirms that it's true. So the absurdity of the incarnation is viewed as an uh, as an objection and an offense by the unbeliever, but Climaticus views the reaction of being offended as an indirect testing of the correctness of the paradox. And so they suggest here that Evans explains that since we would expect people to find the incarnation absurd and offensive, the fact that they do is indirect confirmation of its truth. A person who wanted to make up a story would make up something much more plausible, as you know, as you have just alluded to and talked about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So the argument from offense, it's 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 offensive, it's absurd. Well, okay, that's the idea that the paradoxical idea then is that kind of shows that it's it's true. Who would make up something like that? Right. I, I don't I don't uh, you know, I don't get offended at uh, at uh, the, the head of the Pantheon coming down in cow form and producing children. Uh, you know, that that doesn't offend me. I don't get angry at that idea. But yet uh, once Christians start t talking about Christian theology, well, then all of a sudden, you know, it's it's uh, Sky Daddy and, uh, you know, all these other yeah. uh, uh, yeah. negative things. And, you know, you, you want to kill us and you hate us and all this stuff. <laughs> yeah, and, yeah uh, we're not offended at yeah. nobody's offended at Santa Claus or yeah. the Tooth Fairy right. or the Easter Bunny. Right. <laughs> right. But this. Wait, wait. Oh, hold up now. Yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I don't believe in your God and I hate him. Yes. <laughs> Well, the, the third one then is that the argument. Actually, or, I think this one was the fourth. One, one. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, so the 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 fourth one, the fourth of the arguments from from Kierkegaard here is that the argument of, of the book as a whole. Evans contends that the argument of the book as a whole is the Christian doctrine of the incarnation is a plausible idea. Chapter one argues that any genuine alternative to Socrates will have God as our teacher. Uh, quote is saying th that is either we follow a great human teacher or we follow God as teacher. Chapter two argues that God can uh, be our teacher ultimately only if he gives himself in love by becoming one of us. Chapter three argues then that natural theology, rational proofs of God's existence is a failure. And therefore, if we are to know God, he must reveal himself. Again, here's where the fetism uh, comes into play here. Chapter four and five imply the historical apologetics is pointless, pointless, he says, uh, because faith is uh, produced by an encounter with God and cannot be grounded on arguments or evidence. And again, I, I, I would point to this as, as you know, uh, uh, many a times in debates, you hear uh, the Christian side ask the atheist side, what would it take for you to believe? Well, I don't know, but uh, an all-knowing all God would know. Well, yeah, exactly. That's the Christian message in and of itself <laughs> is this this modernistic approach to to faith. And so here, uh, Kierkegaard is is in good contentions here. Unbelievers are offended by the incarnation not because it supposedly lacks evidence, but because they find it absurd. How dare you tell me <laughs> that I need a, 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 an incarnate God to come down in human form and take up my sin? A sin? What is that? That's that's offensive to me. I don't know why, but it is. Yeah, and so our authors tell us that uh, Evans' reading then of the philosophical fragments, this particular book, shows that uh, we must be careful not to read too much into Kierkegaard's um, rejection of apologetics. So on the one hand, Kierkegaard rejected attempts to make Christianity plausible, right, in the sense of making it into an intellectual system to which one might uh, comfortably give assent, right? True Christianity always requires leaving our comfort zone, <laughs> And then on the other hand, though, Kierkegaard offered constructive suggestions for ways to show indirectly that Christianity is true while retaining its radical life-changing character. Right. 
There is, to be sure, a naive and irrational fetism that waves all questions and squelches all doubts with a demand of just believe. That's it. That's all you need. But this is not the kind exemplified by Kierkegaard. Indeed, from his perspective, it's a nominal <clears throat> Christian who assumes he is a Christian because of his baptism, doctrinal belief, church membership, morality, or even piety that has failed to think seriously and clearly about the Christian faith. And I think that's something, uh, whether you subscribe to this or not, that is a definite challenge for those within the walls of the church. Yeah. All right, so that's Kierkegaard, and he's a clearly a uh, phileus, right? Uh, the next person that our book uh, wants us to consider is Karl Barth. And Barth, uh, uh, 1886 to 1968, is widely regarded, they suggest, as one of the most important and influential theologians of the 20th century. So his early theological development is what they want to start us with, kind of give us a running start into his ideas. So during his years teaching in Germany, Bart wrestled to come to terms with both the teachings of the Bible and the theological heritage of uh, church's history. His mentors from 1910 to 1920 had been Harnack, Harman, and the father of theological liberalism, uh, Friedrich Schumacher. Uh, and during the 20s, his mentors were Luther, Calvin, and Anselm. And so while his theology increasingly inclined toward the views of Luther and Calvin, his theological method was shaped through his distinctive reading of uh, Anselm. Hmm. A, a very interesting person within church history, for sure. <laughs> Uh, Bart uh, challenged the conventional interpretation of Anselm's th theology as an attempt to establish the rationality of Christianity apart from Revelation. So he wants to do it apart from Revelation. Rather, Bart argued Anselm himself stated that his method was one of faith-seeking understanding. That is, of a person who has already accepted God's revelation in faith, then seeking to articulate a rational understanding of the meaning of that revelation. So, I have faith now. Is it right for me to hold it? So let me go and find that answer is what yeah. uh, he's doing. Faith seeking understanding. Right? Yeah. So Bart then interpreted uh, Anselm as taking the paradoxical approach of humbly identifying himself with unbelievers in their astonishment at the Christian message in order to conquer uh, them with its truth. The apologist is not to seek a neutral common ground between Christianity and non-Christianity on which both can reach a truce. Oh, oh okay. Hold on now. <laughs> no neutrality, right? No neutrality. Nor is uh, the apologist uh, to remain triumphantly on Christian ground, demonstrating the truth of Christianity to his own satisfaction while ignoring the perspective of the non-Christian. So neither of those are the position that the apologist should take. Mm -hmm. Mark suggested that the apologist is rather to present Christian truth as the answers to questions that he asks right along with the non-Christian. Right. All right. So we're kind of searching for it together kind of <laughs> idea. We're both down in the mud. Let's muck around. <laughs> That's right. Well, what about uh, Barth's Church Dogmatics? He published the Church Dogmatics and in installments in German from uh, 1932 to 1959, probably one of the most influential writings that he's probably known for. Volume two, The Doctrine of God, that uh, was uh, there in 1940 and 42, is a volume of obvious relevance, uh, uh, relevance uh, to apologetics. Barth begins by arguing that the true God is the one who is known to us exclusively at his initiative by his revealing of himself to us in the word of God. This means that natural theology is an utter futile and irrelevant path to the knowledge of God, uh, which uh, again, coming from uh, Anselm and uh, you know the, the, the Roman Catholic uh, uh, departure uh, will, uh, will, will uh, be rubbed the wrong way there. Yeah, and so notice what he's suggesting here. We don't uh, look at nature and then go to God. God takes the initiative and reveals himself to us, right? That's the idea that he's that he's getting at. And so natural theology then is futile because that's not how, and irrelevant because that's not how we come to know God. God comes to know us. He takes the initiative and brings us to himself. Uh, all right, and so uh, they, they give us a brief summary of, uh, you know, his dogmatics, but then at the end they say that... Um, 
you know, they want to highlight two crucial themes or motifs in uh, Barth's theology that are characteristics of fideism and Christian apologetics. First, they say that we can know God and the truth about us in relation to God only by faith in his revelation. So by faith alone, we know that God is real, that he is absolutely personal and a perfect being, and that he created and providentially cares for us. So this is clearly a fideistic kind of position, right? Mm, right. And, and then secondly, our knowledge of and about God is gained directly from Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit and only indirectly from Scripture. So this is kind of interesting here. This is what made Bart uh, controversial, his view of Scripture. So rather than basing, Christ, uh, basing Christian knowledge on the Bible as the foundation of a rational worldview, as in various forms of reform apologetics, Barth uh, bases Christian knowledge on Jesus Christ as the embodiment of God and of God's purpose for mankind. Well, how do we assess Barth? Well, Barth's uh, theology has been highly controversial among evangelicals, particularly in the English-speaking world. Who knew that the English-speaking world would have such issues with a German theologian? Well, <laughs> given the diversity of opinion and the complexity of many of the criticism of Bart, we cannot enter into this debate here, but can only offer some general observations. So this is what our authors are trying to do to say, listen, there might be some issues out there. We have to address something. And so here's uh, some general observations. Well, first of all, Bart clearly intended his theology to be evangelical Protestant in character. Second, although Bart espoused an evangelical Protestant position, the soundness of his theology has been widely questioned by conservative evangelicals and probably not outside the realm of uh, reason. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then third, Barth's theological legacy is clearly pro uh, problematic for evangelicals in some important aspects. Although assessment of his view of scripture, as we mentioned earlier, very significantly, everyone agrees that he denied the inerrancy of scripture as well as this character as propositional revelation. Mm -hmm. Barth's teaching on this subject uh, seems to have helped create the neo-evangelical view of Scripture as theologically uh, authoritative, but factually errant, mm -hmm. right? And so, of course, uh, evangelicals to, uh, will not agree with that. Right, right. And For then the finally, most part, anyway. Right, <laughs> the true, true, to, to some degree. And finally, uh, Bart himself recognized a significant divide between his theology and that of conservative Protestantism. So, hey, at least he recognized it, too. Although he considers himself reformed, he distanced himself from traditional Calvinism. And maybe Calvinism was uh, uh, happy for that as well. <laughs> <laughs> Although Bart was not soundly evangelical, he represents an important and influential voice in Christian theology. And I would say that's probably something that cannot be avoided. All right, and then the uh, <clears throat> the final uh, person that they want us to consider, Donald Blowish, is a uh, is unfamiliar name to most evangelicals. They tell us, but he is becoming even more widely known and respected as one of Americans' leading evangelical theologians. So Blowish's writings during the '60s focused on renewal in church, right? But the one notable exception was his uh, book, The Christian Witness in a Secular Age. And in this book, he examines the apologetic thought of nine 20th century theologians, beginning with Barr and um, including Neubauer and other more liberal theologians. Yeah. So he uh, defines apologetics as uh, this, as the attempt to make the faith plausible to the world of unbelief on the basis of the criterion held in common with unbelief. While well, he bases his rejection of such apologetics of Luther's teaching that man is in bondage to sin. And he quotes Bart, Calvin, and Pascal to support the conclusion that the gospel cannot be correlated with man's searching in culture and religion. Again, he quotes Kierkegaard and Luther in support of his assertion that, quote, that God's truth is beyond the reach of man's conception and perception, even as Christians for whom God remains hidden, even in the act of revelation. And he also says that with Bart, we contend that uh, revelation must be proclaimed, not defended, or even recommended in the sense of trying to heighten its value. 
Right. So according to Bloish, then apologetics is the attempt to compel a man by rational means to assent to the truth of uh, of faith. That's what the traditional kind of um, uh, definition is. But in place of such religious imperialism, he calls this traditional <laughs> approach, he advocates gospel evangelism. This is a presentation of the message that people need to believe in uh, Christ for salvation. While Bloish rejects apologetics as traditionally conceived as a preparation for and validation of the gospel, right? That's the traditional concept of apologetic. It kind of prepares people, that kind of stuff, or it validates the gospel. He acknowledges that there is an element of truth in the traditional apologetic enterprise with which it must not be lost. And what is that? Well, apologetics is needed to clarify our own, our own Christians' own understanding of the gospel so that we can be sure that what we are preaching is indeed the gospel and not a message accommodated to the culture. Mm. And so this apologetics in the context of faith-seeking understanding is his kind of idea here. Right. So again, we we have faith, and now it's our uh, sanctification process. It's going out and making sure we're within the lines. And uh, coming from kind of a uh, disciple of Bart, uh, that that uh, might be a little bit uh, 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 committed. Uh, yeah, the lines uh, might be comedy. a little blurry. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Physician, heal thyself there. <laughs> All right. Well. We come to the conclusion of this portion, and we say that very often fetism is used as a pejorative label to censure views of faith and reason that are to the left of the person applying to the label. Not surprisingly, hardly anyone will confess to being a fetus. <laughs> using the term in this way would appear to render it as a subjective judgment rather than a useful description of a particular position, and we've talked about that in the last episode as well. Right. And so our author suggests then that it's time to rehabilitate the uh, the term fetus I and mean, use it to refer to an approach to apologetics uh, that not only exists as more than a caricature of an extreme, but is also, in fact, highly influential. Uh, as we've seen, they suggest that there is a significant tradition in Christian theology taking a distinctive approach to faith and reason that runs from Luther to Kierkegaard to Bart and Bloish, among others. Yes. So it's uh, what there our authors are saying. It's time to have faith in fetism. <laughs> right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, like Reformed apologists, these fetus argue that the traditional apologetic method of trying to defend Christianity as reasonable on the basis of the principles acceptable to non-Christian is unbiblical and unworkable. Unlike Reformed apologists, though, fetus hold that Christianity cannot be shown, at least directly, to be reasonable even as a Christian system based on Christian principles. Rather, they try to show non-Christians that Christianity is reasonable. These opponents of traditional apologetics urge us to try to show them that Christianity is faithful, that is faithful to God and to his revelation in Jesus Christ. How this approach transforms the apologetic task will be spelled out in the next two chapters that we um, go over. Right. So that uh, that concludes our chapter uh, 16 for uh, for the fetus position, uh, the historical position. Um, we left in the in this and last episode in this episode uh, quite a bit out, uh, and that's for the purposes of making sure that uh, we keep uh, well enough within a half hour ish uh, time time frame for our, our episodes. Uh, but we suggest that you pick up the book. Uh, it's available on uh, Kindle. It's uh, Amazon. It's in Logos. It's uh, probably a, a number of other different places. And um, um, we suggest that uh, you pick it up as well because uh, we have it, and we've uh, again this is our second time going over this book together. And uh, we've really, really enjoyed it and think it does a phenomenal job of just classifying and clarifying um, uh, these four apologetic methods and uh, even sneaks in a fifth one to help us out as well. All right. So next time we look at the meta apologetics of fetism and see if they have anything to say or if it's just just believe, man, that's it. That's all we need to do. And so yeah. if so, it'll be a short episode. So you'll see <laughs> next time uh, when you download our episode or uh, go to click on it, if it's uh, within that half hour time frame, uh, we might have things to say about uh, what fetus have to say, which is uh, reasons of the heart. Hmm. Yeah. All right. Great. So thanks for joining us and we'll see you next time. We'll see you next time.